Hello and welcome to Unsource Wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I am your host. Okay, so I think this is actually going to be kind of a short episode, but I seem to be really bad at estimating these things. So it might be the longest episode yet. I don't know. But first things first, let's just move on into some movie news because we really don't have much here. But let's just start this by getting into the Adams Family movie teaser. It's just not that good. People are talking about the designs a lot. And while I have my own thoughts on those, the trailer itself is just insanely lame. It's pretty unfunny and lacking any discernible personality outside of references and sight gags. Like really cheap and lazily thought ones. It just comes off as any other really underwritten and low effort family animated film. Which is a shame because the Addams Family is actually a really unique property and they aren't really putting in the work to make that the selling point. It's rather just, hey look how wacky they are. And remember it? Apparently the biggest problem for people though is that Gomez is fat. When we all know that the thing having a wristband is the worst possible design choice. It will haunt my dreams forever. And it's the one spooky, kooky, and ooky thing about this movie trailer. Fingers crossed I am wrong though and that this trailer isn't representative of the movie at all and that it's just there to win over the crowds. I really hope that's the case. And that's really it for movie news outside of the fact that The Rock has started teasing that the Black Adam movie will start production soon, which I'm of two minds about. Like I said in my Shazam review, I think it's a really bad idea. It just seems pointless if they go directly for the anti-hero stuff. But The Rock did this all in the video where he states that the movie will be Black Adam's origin story. Which, honestly, if they went balls out, and were bold enough to make this a through and through tragedy, then it could work. It could be something really unique and special. And then keep the fallout contained to Shazam 3 for the genuine capitulation of all this. That would be pretty amazing. So it probably won't happen because it's The Rock and because he's been so attached to his character for so long, he might have lost perspective about all this. But it's the only way that it could be something interesting, which is a shame, but still. Fingers crossed. Moving on to TV news, let's start some casting news. This week we got Game of Thrones' Ian Glenn as Batman for Season 2 of Titans, which, sadly, eliminates the possibility that it's a self-sequel to Gotham, because that would have been so cool. People have noted that Ian Glenn is pretty old, while Bruce is normally only slightly older than Dick. But that's why I like it. It sort of draws the hard division between the line of superhero and sidekick. And Bruce's youth has always started to seem more like the after effect of drawn out timelines or comics than anything else. What's funny to note is that at one point Ian Glenn was actually set to play Night Owl in Watchmen. So it's kind of nice to see him land somewhere with DC. I hope they do a good job here. Titan Season 2 needs to be an uphill tick to finally solidify that the DC Universe streaming app no Knows what it's doing with its original content. Speaking of original content, we also have a huge amount of confirmed Disney Plus MCU shows. All of these were already announced, but now they're confirmed, and they all sound pretty mediocre. The What If show still seems like a very limited and uninteresting prospect. And giving shows to Falcon, Winter Soldier, Vision, Scarlet Witch, and Hawkeye, it's baffling considering how dull they were in these movies. You think with the nigh unlimited resources that Disney has, they would have more to offer by way of MCU extensions. I'm still wishing them the best, but this is not any draw at all, and fingers crossed. Lastly, we have confirmation that Tom Welling will be in the final season of Arrow, probably during Crisis on Infinite Earths, meaning that Arrow's five seasons just became seasons 11 through 14 of Smallville. Those are the rules, I don't make them up. I probably won't watch his return, mainly because the tonal differences between Smallville's highs and Arrow's highs are just way too disparate to make that any way enjoyable, but it's still at least nice to know that they're out there somewhere in the void, and well, hopefully it's able to capture some of the magic of Smallville, even though I have zero hope that it's able to. Godspeed anyway. And finally, we hit comic news, and in terms of comic news, the only thing we really have is that Gerard Way's young animal imprint truly isn't dead. Doom Patrol and a new Green Lantern series are on their way with a star-studded lineup of writers and artists. Doom Patrol returning this July and the Green Lantern series is following a new Earth Green Lantern on an adventure in a far sector, which sounds like it could be pretty interesting. Green Lantern Mythos is always something new that you can really sort of dig your heels into and make something special and immediately engaging out of. So fingers crossed for them. There's also a standalone sci-fi series coming from Young Animal 
animal called Collapser. And I wish it the best of luck. Good for all of them. And I'm glad that it's back. I know there are a lot of people who are really fans of this imprint. And it's good that their faith and that their fandom wasn't completely wasted. And so that leaves us with what I read this week. First things up is Hawkman number 11. This issue really had one job. Being a blowout. You have every Hawkman imaginable, faceless mobs of villains, and a densely populated area. You need to bring the goods. And it kinda does. This issue does show a lot of Hitch's weaker points, especially regarding the weight and impact of his figures, but it's still just a raucous good time. A good amount of Hawks, old and newly revealed, get some moments in. Kryptonian Hawkman reveling in the sunlight and Nighthawk, the Wild West Hawkman, just shooting his guns into the air. It's funny, lively, and it brings a smile to my face. For all of the somewhat slower valleys this series has dipped into, this gives everything a charged and direct funnel for the heroic energy and force that this insane sequence is meant to represent. There's really only two things that bring it down a bit. Like I said, Hitch's figures and fights can be very stiff at times. It lacks the tight momentum to really get us going with all the intense and ridiculous things going on. The secondary thing is that the main villain is just boring. I can hardly remember anything he said and he talked a lot and I can't even remember his name. It's a bit of a shame that he hasn't turned out to be more memorable or have more personality. It would have helped in giving this arc some last minute charm boost. Overall though, the next issue will be the last of this first season of sorts and Hitch's last issue on this run. So I wish it the best. I can't wait. Even though I am worried it won't be able to stick the landing, this series and this run so far has been just a delight. It really has been. So I'm hopeful and my fingers are crossed. One thumb up, one thumb middle. Next up we have Red Hood Outlaw number 37. This was a bit of a standard issue. Not much is really developed here outside of reintroducing the status quo and myth arc from the original New 52 run. Which is nice I guess, but it definitely wasn't something that I was at all interested in way back when it started and I'm really struggling to give a shit about it now. Just feel like a step down from the whole now flattened solitaire stuff and more like a way to pad things out or call back to older fans. It's done decently enough though. There's not much fakery or real intrusion that you feel here, but there's really nothing else that's going on. It just seems like there was a void and he filled it with older stuff, which is fine, but it's a bit of a shame and there's a loss of creativity there because you had this whole new setup that you could have done anything with. All together though, it's still an average, if duller than usual, read. Two thumbs middle. Moving ahead, we have Scooby Apocalypse number 36. This is the finale to one of the weirdest, strangest, and honestly most flabbergasting incarnations and entries in the entire Scooby-Doo franchise. One that, for all the great things it did and horrible flaws it had, will definitely be remembered. I'm going to miss it a lot, but did this finale live up to it? I'll be honest, not really, but not for lack of trying. It just has this very rushed quality to it. It feels very packed and running over. The art is also insanely scratchy and underdeveloped in very obvious places. Some pages are fine. This leads me to think that they had to print this much earlier than they thought or that things had to be changed immediately and that they only had time to work off the sketches themselves. The development of the story and where it leads to, however, is totally okay. I really enjoyed that. It's oddly sweet for this series and the places that the series has gone overall and I have no doubt that this would have been a much darker ending if Giffen had stayed on to the end. But there is this comfy and hearty note and it plays it well all the way to the end. The rest of the tune here just isn't up to snuff. I'm glad though that it decided to play a few things straight and hold true to them. Scooby Apocalypse was a very shaky and indecisive series but it was always direct in wherever it decided to go for as long as it could before radically changing direction again. It's going to be really weird to live on in a world where Scooby Apocalypse ain't a thing, but God bless it. And I hope for one day it gets adapted into a DTV or something because that would be amazingly hilarious. One thumb up, one thumb middle. And lastly, we have Wonder Twins number three, a deftly and engagingly handled issue. One of my main complaints last issue was that the tonal shifts and weaknesses in trying to balance out the drama were so overbearing and very noticeable. This issue, however, definitely hits the right groove. The characters in their moments of pathos and emotional trauma, even going up to Gleek the monkey, are well placed, very much developed, and dug into the way the characters feel in a natural and hard hitting manner. Russell makes it look so easy to feel for these characters and to really emphasize with them but there is definite craft and skill going into making all this work. It's really incredible. Again the things that come off as part of the overall message don't feel like a burden and make sense with the way these characters are being introduced and how they are being developed and how they are growing. The art is also given so much to do here as well giving this series a nice brisk 
refreshing palette and aesthetic. It's joyous. It's a really joyous series in every single aspect. Even the more dramatic and really sort of deafy stuff you get embroiled into because it has this allure to it. And it's honestly a fun series. And only midway through, so that's a good sign. It definitely sets up a lot and it's promising a lot, but it has the actual dexterity to know how to place and pace things. So I'm hopeful. I really am. Two thumbs up. Finally, we only have one thing I watched this week. I did not watch Hellboy. If I ever do, I'll do a review of it then. So what we have this week is Doom Patrol Season 1, Episode 9, Jane Patrol. Well, I am happy to say that I ended up being right about last week. Some of the less engaging and overall weaker tones and substances did leave a lot of room for this to be something special. And this episode is yet another unique and solid singular narrative that this show has become so talented at crafting. It's an entirely focused and skilled character piece for Jane, scuttling off the rest of the team outside of Robot Man, and it does a great job of it. It does a great job of both of these characters. However, it's probably the first Jane episode and plot thread for her that doesn't have much in ways of lulls or dips. It's incredibly tight, and Jane is treated with a lot of respect as an individual character with a lot of actual drama and pathos to offer, and they go as hard-hitting and as introspective as they can within the time frame and inside the premise. It's honestly quite a immersive while also being able to really peek in the same way as other Jane episodes have been able to with ease. I haven't had much of a problem with that before so it's great to still see it all come together like that. That they can really take advantage of slower quieter beats means a lot and they still pack a hell of a punch. It really does prove that they can work with Jane in a way that isn't just engaging by way of narrative or by way of placement, but also in ways that uses the full potential of Diane Guerrero as an actress. Brendan Fraser gets in some amazing moments here too, in the flesh, as an actor, and it's a fucking delight to see him. Even without the Robot Man exterior, he just embodies the character in his own physicality. No offense to Riley Shanahan at all. They are a great duo. However, seeing Brendan move around is awesome. And it makes you believe when he finally decides to embrace who he has become as a person after his horrible death. Overall, a pretty damn good episode. Maybe it hasn't led to the same heartbreak as other Jane beats, at least for me, but it's more mature and practiced and it's better for it. So two thumbs up. I can't wait for this episode. Hopefully the side story sort of split the decisions they made here allow the next episode to really stand on its own as well. Fingers crossed. All right, so we've hit listener questions and we have two this week. The first one is from the ever amazing Medea and their question is, in honor of the film, what are my favorite Hellboy arcs? So given Hellboy's publication style and the way I haven't delved at all enough into BPRD and related Hellboy spinoffs properly, let's just get into favorite stories in general. Funnily enough, most of these are what the new movie itself is drawing from. Hellboy Mexico for one. I love the Camazot story with the two luchadores. It's a perfect premise and executed amazingly with a fun dash of emotion and heart. It's so good. The Wild Hunt is just a sweet singular adventure with good foundational bones and Storm and the Fury has King Arthur. I mean, fuck yeah. All of them. Just great beats, big or small. Outside of that, I have to admit I also really enjoyed ones like Hellboy in Africa. I think it was called. Not necessarily the main Africa bit, but the section of the whole saga where he goes on to meet all sorts of creatures on sort of a world tour. Like these sirens. It's probably the best bit of what Hellboy is all about. This vibrant and interesting world that you can explore and really immerse yourself into. Similarly to The Crooked Man, which is just another one-off adventure that I think really works because it had its own internal logic and storyline and Hellboy just sort of dropped into it. And it's just this insanely tightly wound, really, really eerie piece. And it has my favorite Hellboy artist of all time, Richard Corbett. So yeah, perfect. But really, I love Hellboy in Hell. Just this pitch perfectly serene and somber atmosphere, quiet but knowingly impactful and just well handled to the extreme and it's a shame to hear from other fans that the main wrap up of the Hellboy storyline is going really badly because this ending was just so great and it felt like a new when to stop. Ah well I guess it's better to remember the good times and those were my favorite Hellboy stories. I hope I answered your question to the best of my ability Medea and that my tastes weren't so bad. Our second and last question comes from the awesome Eggmath and their question is what short runs on any title do you wish creators got to spend a longer time with? 
and that they don't mean early canceled books? That's a bit of a tough question, given that cancellations are so sudden and leave a lot of potential, while purposefully short runs are usually better at telling the story they want to tell in a complete or at least somewhat satisfying way. And that short runs that are just fill-ins or things where the creators moved on almost immediately after finishing off one storyline, well... It's hard to really dwell on it because it happens so often, although there'll be one or two in this. But there are a few standouts, and let's slip into the small handful I would give an arm and a leg to have more of. First off, we have American Freak, a miniseries from Vertigo. Now this miniseries told the story of a second generation of Unmen, one of Anton Arcane's hideous monster creations, with the main character leading his people to freedom and prosperity in a nature preserve. It was a solid character piece that did a lot to humanize and contextualize the Unmen in a way that hadn't ever been done before. I would have loved to see more of this main character and how he deals with the fallout of his actions and his life afterward. The series did get a semi-continuation, but it bypasses most of what made its original entry great. Next would be Q2, The Return of Quantum and Woody. I'll just say it, Valiant's reboot of Quantum and Woody has been god-awful. So it was great to see Bright and Priest return, and they really didn't miss a beat. I would have loved to have seen this grow into a real ongoing and finally answer what the hell happened with Dr. David and Eclipse and whether or not they actually saved the world. It would have been pretty amazing. And and Priest and Bright still have the chops to meld together humor and hard-hitting, tear-jerking, soul-crushing drama. So it was pretty fucking good. There are a few others like GoBots, which I wish would have been able to have been longer to elucidate some of the murkier themes and symbolism. But other than that, there are a small few that come to mind that fit the criteria anyhow. One of the big ones has to be Francis Manipal's and Brian Buccellato's Flash run for the New 52. They had a second season planned, but they were were replaced by Robert Venditti and Brett Booth and they moved on to Detective Comics and fuck that because Robert Venditti single-handedly destroyed that book and it's never been able to recover and it's only gotten worse because at least Venditti was trying to be entertaining unlike Williamson and when you hear the small snippets of what Bucciolato and Manipal actually wanted to do and what they wanted to introduce and build up it becomes a shame it's a real shame that they didn't get much longer on that run to be able to really play with what they wanted to like wally west the burgeoning romance between iris and barry all these amazing things that were then rushed and jaggedly forced in by other crappier writers like i know manipal and booch weren't the best writers but they handled the flash perfectly they knew exactly what beats to do when to do them and while their pacing wasn't the best, the emotional pacing was. So yeah, no, I really wish that that run could have been longer, even though it lasted for like two years. I would also say Matt Kent for JLA because he also got a really short fill-in run, but that book was canceled immediately after anyway, so that probably counts as early cancellation books, which is what I mean about these runs where things don't really get that much to do because you become so commonplace that you just kind of forget about them. I think the only other really big one, and probably my last last one for this question is Earth 2. It has to be Earth 2 by James Robinson because Earth 2 lasted like another four fucking years after he left and it never got any good. It just got worse and worse and worse and then a little bit more average and boring and then that was it. Then it ended. But James Robinson's Earth 2 was something unique. It was something special. It knew what it wanted to do and it knew exactly how to lay it out and to build on it and to create the foundation for an actual series, an actual IP, these properties, these characters, and to treat them with respect and to know how to give them longevity in the modern day and to make them forces of their own. And then he left because they decided to fuck him over a lot and some other behind the scenes shit. And so it became Came this horse shit series that was nothing but meandering DCU references and really bad and the role plots. So yeah, I wish that James Robinson had been given the chance to develop and finish his run the way he saw fit and we'll never see it. We'll never see where that could have gone. So those are my answers to your questions, Agmath. I hope I answered them to the best of my ability and maybe in some universe these runs exist. But thank you for the question. Thank you both for the questions, Agmath and Medea. They both meant so much to me. They were both amazing questions. They both made me think a lot and I hope that you enjoyed both of them. I know I enjoyed answering them. I also want to say thank you to everyone else who ever sent in questions, comments, or topics to this show. 
it means so much especially since next week it's going to be our first year anniversary with our 52nd episode meaning that it's been one year since I started this show and it's gonna be great I had such a great time doing this I hopefully will be able to have done a lot more work on the Hulk commentary it might be a little delayed I'm sorry for that but I really want to make it something special so anyway thank you all if you have your own questions comments or thoughts that you want to sit into the show then you can contact me on twitter at t-h-e underscore s-n-i-c-k-m-a-n i also want to give a shout out to the cover artists for the show at d-o-t-e-m-c-e-e go give them a follow give them some traffic they really deserve it anyway thank you all so much for listening and see you next week for the one year anniversary of the show it's been amazing it's been such a trip hope you have a great week and uh, see you then